Good morning. Welcome to Bethesda United Methodist Church. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Thank you. <laughs> and we want to welcome those who are joining us online. And I want to say a spe special hello to Faye Brinkley, if you're able to join us online, we miss you and we are praying for you and thinking of you. Um, we want to begin this morning with some announcements and I invite you to look in your bulletin. Um, first of all, I want to lift up that we're going to have a Keep Davidson County Beautiful group meeting to do trash pickup along Bethesda Church Road and Sink Roads. And we'll meet at Bethesda at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, September 27th. And that will work well because those of you who are in the morning prayer service on Tuesday, we've got a little rough riding ahead of us because um, I'm attending a spiritual academy this week, so we won't have prayer Tuesday morning. So come out and help them clean up the road. <laughs> because uh, I won't be here that day. And you see some other dates um, that I had conflicts also. And then also wanted to lift up to you that very exciting Sunday, next Sunday, will be our first Sunday in the sanctuary. And we'll celebrate World Communion Sunday there. And so please join us at 10 o'clock in the sanctuary. It's gonna be a great time to be together. Also, uh, we have a barbecue chicken fundraiser with the United Methodist Men on October 15th, pick up from 11 to 1 at the Fellowship Hall. So plan to come out and participate in that, get some good food. And our prayer shawl ministry group will meet Thursday, October 6th at 10 o'clock in the old library. We were are planning to have Trunk or Treat on October 31st. So uh, let Sonia Craver know if you plan to decorate a trunk or participate in some way. And oh, and I had something come up uh, this week, maybe a little unusual. I don't know if y'all have had this happen before, but the Lexington Police Department contacted me because they're having a fundraiser. I think it's their annual fundraiser where they make a big calendar um, and they have ads around the, the dates. The dates are in the middle and the ads go around. So they wanted to know if we wanted to participate by buying an ad. And there's a whole range of prices from you know smallest to large. So, um, since we don't have like administrative board coming up anytime really soon, I thought, y'all tell me what you think about this. Don't throw tomatoes. But I thought maybe next week when we have our World Communion Sunday um, service, we could have a special offering, maybe towards the end of it. And if you wanna give to the Lexington Police Department fundraiser, you can put your dollar in the basket and whatever we end up with, I'll give them for an ad. If we don't have enough for ad, we'll just make a little donation to them. Does that sound okay? Okay, nobody's twisting your arm. You just put your dollar in the basket if you want to. Okay, excellent. Well, if there are no other announcements, then let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and almighty God, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. You are so good to us, and you bless us so many ways, and we know you have blessed us with this day, and each day is a gift. So help us, Lord, to be mindful of that and to live this day in your will and to live this day with joy in our hearts that we have another day to be with each other and to be with you. Lord, as we gather as your faith community, open our hearts and minds to you and fill us with your Holy Spirit. May this be a time that deepens our understanding of you as we hear your word proclaimed. And may it be a time that draws us closer to you and closer to each other. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. If you would, please stand and sing with us. world I'll never 
King of all kings. Do I bow my knee and sing and give my everything? Only a God like you could be worthy of my praise and all my hope and faith. To only a King of all kings. Do I bow my knee and sing and give my everything? To only my Maker, my Father, my Savior, Redeemer, Restorer, Rebuilder, Rewarder. To only a God like you. Do I give my praise? You know, sometimes it's hard to feel um, like I've worshipped because of being the clergy person that's up here trying to remember a lot of things, and you know, a certain amount of anxiety comes with the job. But I have to tell you, with this worship band and leader, I feel like I have worshipped when I leave here. We are so blessed to have Devin and Sandy, Chuck, Tracy, Avery, and all the others who participate from time to time. It's such a blessing. Thank you. We have some prayer concerns this morning. 
um, all in the path of the storm that's coming through Key West, Faye Brinkley, some unspoken prayer requests, Woodrow Bowman, Linda Brinkley, Luther. Also, you'll find in, in your bulletin, uh, the family of Steve Hinkle, the family of Ronnie Mendenhall, Jim and Carol Wagner, Kimberly Money, Keith Wagner, 9-11 and Our Freedom, Russell Brown, Wally Butler, Emma Carter, Jim Hooker, Linda Jarvis, Elaine Latham, Patsy Madron, Nancy McCrary, Mary Alice Myers, George Ann Ray, Frida Schoff, and Shirley Younce. And I'd like to add um, from my visits this week, Jack Merritt, <clears throat> Jack Merritt, some of you may uh, remember, and some of you uh, maybe are too young to remember him, but he was an active member of the church, and he has recently had his leg amputated. And I can't imagine uh, the nightmare that that would be, so I lift him up to you and up to the Lord, and let's remember him in prayer. So let us go to the Lord in prayer now. Gracious God, we are so thankful for all of the many ways you bless our lives, Lord. We know that it's important when we come together as your faith community to give you all praise and, and thanksgiving. You are so good to us. You have blessed us in so many ways, and you have blessed us to have this faith community here in welcome in this place right here today, Bethesda United Methodist Church. What a great blessing, and we are so blessed with our property and our building, but we're even more blessed with all the people who are a part of this congregation, uh, those that come here and worship with us, and those who come to Sunday school and to circles and to Bible studies and to all of the many uh, programs that we put on, Vacation Bible School. We touch so many lives in this community through Bethesda, and we just thank you so much for that, Lord, and thank you for each and every person who comes here to worship you and to give you all praise and thanksgiving. We know that it's also important when we come together to give to you the things that cause us fear and doubt and concern. Those are the things that get in our heads and in our hearts and we find that we're thinking about that instead of thinking about you. And we don't want that. We don't want to be carrying all those burdens and then opening our mouths and spreading those burdens to others. We want to instead spread grace and love and mercy to others. So as we gather this morning, help us to just give those things to you, all of the things that cause us worry and concern, just leave them right here in your good hands, Lord, because we know that all things are in your hands and you're always working for good in our lives. So help us to rest in our faith in you and give you the things that trouble us so that we might be filled with your grace and your love and all of your good gifts as we hear your word proclaimed this morning. Build us up Build each one of us up and build us up as a community of faith so that we might be the light of Christ in this community and spread the love and grace of Christ across the land to a world that is hurting and is lost and is confused. Help us to carry you, Lord, and be instruments of your grace and peace. We ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. And now we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The 
Eu și-l pui pe apul. I see any children. Are there any children that want to come up? Anybody feeling childish that would like to come up? Um, if not, then we will have our gospel lesson, which comes to us this morning from the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. Are we not going to have slides? Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Well, if you have your Bible, it's Luke 16, verses 19 to 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. 
and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm go- I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us bow for a moment of prayer. Gracious and almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm calling this uh, sermon, Discovering Our Spiritual Family, which is the next slide. So I'm going to tell you a little story that happened. Um, Gosh, it's been like 13 years ago, because it was before my son had his driver's license. It was a Saturday morning. And Steve and I took my son John to have his trumpet lesson. And he did this at the home of the trumpet instructor. And so this fellow lived near the intersection of Robin Hood and Peace Haven in Winston-Salem, if you're familiar with Winston-Salem, right? So if you like picture the intersection, Peace Haven runs this way and Robin Hood runs this way. He lived over here, kind of in the upper left quadrant. And so we decided to drop him off, and then we went to do an errand down here in the lower left quadrant. So we go to run this errand. There's a little shopping center there. And we come out, and we lock the keys in the car. So we're like, what are we going to do? So we decide, we'll walk back and see if we can get help from the trumpet instructor. So as we start to walk back, over here on the right top quadrant, they have just been doing some building, developing that area. So like there's a new bank and a new medical facility and shopping centers, all kinds of stuff over there, right? So we're walking along and I'm saying, why didn't they put a sidewalk in when they did all this development. They should be encouraging people to walk in this you know, highly developed area where people could walk from one store to another and stuff like that. Why don't they encourage people to walk? They should be putting the sidewalks in. And I'm going on and on and on. And Steve says, there's a sidewalk right there. I said, no, there's not. Look, there's no sidewalk. He said, look, there's a sidewalk right there. Well, we kept walking and walking, and guess what came into view? A sidewalk. (laughs) Uh, Have you ever had something like that happen to you? Where you just were so sure that you knew what you were seeing, but you weren't seeing what was really there. You were blind to something right in front of you. Sometimes we're wrong about something that's trivial, like whether or not there's a sidewalk, but sometimes we can be wrong about something that's really, really important. And I mentioned this a couple weeks ago to you. Sometimes we can be wrong about a core belief, something that we are really standing on and we're sure of. And I told you that 
I had an experience like that before too, where I really, really thought we were supposed to, as good Christians, stay away from criminals. And then the Holy Spirit entered in and just mixed me all up and made me realize that's not what God wants. After I took disciple Bible study and found out that Jesus said we're supposed to go to prison. And you know, it really was a big deal to wrestle with that and to change that core belief. But once I was able to let go of that core belief and accept that God was calling me to something different, it changed my whole life. And it really, it made my life better. It really did. When I started following what God wanted me to do and not that belief that had gotten stuck in my head. So that's what I think in our gospel lesson for today, Jesus is trying to get the Pharisees to see the sidewalk. They are blind to what is right in front of them. They have been taking verses of scripture out of context to support and justify their own actions. Jesus is trying to help them interpret scripture differently. The gross misunderstanding that they have involves their very understanding of God. They have misinterpreted who God is and who they are and what the relationship is between God and humanity. The Pharisees have focused on scripture such as three passages, one from Psalm 1 and two from Deuteronomy 28. Let's look at those passages so you understand where they're getting their thinking. So this is Psalm 1. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff, scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. So that was Psalm 1. Now this is from Deuteronomy 28. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I am giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. And one more passage from Deuteronomy 28. But if you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and do not obey all the commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come and overwhelm you. Your towns and your fields will be cursed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be cursed. Your children and your crops will be cursed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be cursed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be cursed. Okay, so there is a message there for us to be faithful to God's commands and to do what God is asking us to do. But from these scriptures, the folks in Jesus' day, the Pharisees, had adopted a belief that God blesses those who are obedient and curses those who are disobedient. And they had taken that core belief And they had looked around them at the people surrounding them, and they had decided those who are rich and prosperous and healthy, well, they must be obedient to God. And therefore, they live in God's favor. Those who are poor and crippled and sickly, well, they must be disobedient to God. And therefore, they're being cursed by God. Therefore, Why should a rich man give to a needy man? 
Why go against the justice that God has already meted out? Surely the poor and the sickly have brought their fate on themselves. Surely if they would just be obedient to God, things would turn around for them. Jesus argues against this way of thinking. That's why Jesus made a point of eating with prostitutes and tax collectors. Jesus reached out to the so-called sinners lying in the streets and at the gates. He taught that we're all sinners. God wants all of us to be obedient. He wants us to be obedient not just for his amusement, but because he wants us to have healthy, fulfilling lives. We cannot simply focus on Psalm 1 and Deuteronomy 28 and think that they say all that we need to know about God and God's justice. We must also look to scripture like Leviticus 19, Deuteronomy 15, and Isaiah 58. So let's look at Deuteronomy 15 now. But if there are any poor Israelites in your towns when you arrive in the land that your Lord, your God, is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Instead, be generous and lend them whatever they need. Do not be mean-spirited and refuse someone a loan because the year for canceling debts is close at hand. If you refuse to make the loan and the needy person cries out to the Lord, you will be considered guilty of sin. Give generously to the poor, not grudgingly, for the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. There will always be some in the land who are poor. That is why I'm commanding you to share freely with the poor and with other Israelites in need. And then from Leviticus 19, When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields, and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. It is the same with your grape crop. Do not strip every last bunch of grapes from the vines, and do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. And then finally from Isaiah. Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin? That last line really gets to me. Even back then, there were people trying to get away from their own family. We don't have anybody here that has that problem, right? I know I have some family members. I kind of like to (laughs) move the other way, but (laughs) yes. Last Sunday, we talked about the unjust manager, and in that passage from earlier in chapter 16 of Luke's Gospel, we talked about something called unjust wealth. We refer to unjust wealth as mammon. When we tell ourselves that we have worked hard for what we have and we deserve what we got, we're forgetting that others have also worked just as hard and sometimes harder, but have received very little. Just think about it for a moment. Wealth is not distributed in a just manner. We simply do not all start out at the same place in the race for money. Think about Wall Street. Do you know the astronomical incomes that come to people who work on Wall Street? I mean, it's just beyond imagination how much money they make. Do you think that they work harder than a school teacher? Do I have any school teachers here who can testify that they work as hard as someone on Wall Street? How about a professional basketball player? They make a whole lot of money. Do they work as hard as a brick mason, Rick Lanier? (laughs) I mean, those of us who came from families in which we enjoyed two parents, a warm home, food on the table, and education, cannot compare ourselves 
to those who did not receive proper nutrition, who never finished school, who moved from foster home to foster home and ne never really knew who their father was. We simply didn't begin at the same starting point and we did not enjoy the same options in life. God wants us to reach out to our brothers and sisters, not just by throwing money at them, but by letting them know that we know that they truly are our brothers and sisters. We talked about this the other night in the men's Bible study. Don't just give a man a fish, teach a man to fish, right? We want to help others and help them to move ahead in their lives, but not just throw money at them. And I say this as someone who is the granddaughter of uh, a man who made it to the fifth grade, and my grandmother got out of the eighth grade. So I know what it is to not get all the way through school. Um, and, you know, we all have had different starting points in our lives, but we need to be mindful that there are people who are struggling, really, truly, uh, because they didn't have the same starting point. Luke tells us in verse 14 that the Pharisees were lovers of money. And Luke 16, 14 says, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all of this and they ridiculed him. Whatever we love that is not God blinds us to the things of God. Whatever we love that is not of God blinds us to the things that are of God. There is a story of a rabbi who would take his new students one by one to a window, and he would have them look out at the children playing on the playground. He would ask, what do you see through this glass? And the student answered, God's children. Then the rabbi asked the student to turn toward a mirror in the room. What do you see through this glass? The student answered, myself. The rabbi said, the difference between this glass and the other is a little bit of silver on the back. When you add a little silver, it blinds you to the rest of the world and keeps you focused on yourself. Jesus told a parable to the Pharisees to help them see that to which they had become blind. He said there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and feasted sumptuously every day. He must have been a rich man indeed because it was very costly to have and wear clothing of fine linen, which was processed for days to make it white, rather than the normal drab gray color everyone else was wearing. And garments were dyed purple by using the juice from the gland of the mollusk found on the eastern Mediterranean coast. It was very costly to obtain purple fabric, and it was actually regulated by law. Only the noble class could wear purple. In a time of food scarcity, we are told this man feasted every day. In contrast, we learn that there is a man named Lazarus, which means God help lying in the rich man's gate. Despite the fact that this rich man is wealthy enough to own a house with a gate, he does not rate being named in Jesus' parable. But the poor man is named. God helps. Lazarus is lying in the rich man's gate, clothed not in purple and fine linen, but in sores, not feasting, but hungering for even the bread that fell from the rich man's table. The dogs that are licking his sores are not sweet little friendly puppies who love Lazarus, but rather they are licking exposed flesh in anticipation of their next meal. Lazarus is not lounging by the rich man's gate, but is under threat of death as he lies there begging for sustenance. We are told the poor man, Lazarus, died and was carried away by angels who took him to be with Abraham. We're not told how he died. Did he starve to death as the rich man feasted just yards away? 
Did he die of infected sores while the rich man enjoyed a hot bath and was anointed with oil? Did he die of exposure while the rich man was warm in his linens? Or did the dogs finally get to him, for he had no gate to protect him? We don't know. And we're not told that the rich, how the rich man died as well. We just don't know. Overeating, diabetes, heart disease, we don't know. We're not told that the rich man is wicked, and we're not told that the poor man is righteous. We are simply told that the poor man ends up with Abraham, and the rich man is in Hades. We're not told this parable to give us an indication of what heaven and hell will be like. And it would be unwise to even focus on that part of the parable because there is a message here that doesn't have to do with that. Jesus is telling this parable to evoke a change in the way we operate right now in this life. In Luke 16.23, we're told, in Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. The rich man cries out to Abraham. He cries, Father Abraham, reminding Abraham that he is a Jew, a descendant of Abraham. He asks for mercy, mercy that he never showed to Lazarus in his lifetime. And interestingly, he asks for Abraham to have Lazarus bring him some water. He seems to know Lazarus by name, so he obviously was aware of Lazarus at the gate, but he did nothing. He still sees Lazarus as no more than an object to serve him. But Abraham denies his request. Abraham reminds the rich man that he received his reward on earth and Lazarus is now receiving his in heaven. There is a great chasm fixed and no one can cross it to go to Hades and no one from Hades can come to heaven. Notice that Abraham does not say that God fixed this chasm. He simply says there is a chasm fixed. Matthew 18 tells us, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The rich man created a chasm around himself with his gate. He hardened his heart to the poor and the needy. He kept himself and his, with his circle of friends and family. In contrast, Lazarus went seeking help where he knew someone had the means to give it to him. He reached out to the rich man. Now the rich man will spend eternity beyond a chasm that he created on earth by cutting himself off from the homeless, the sick, the hungry, the naked, the strangers that were all around him. The rich man begs Abraham to send Lazarus to his brothers to warn them. But Abraham reminds him that his brothers have Moses and the prophets, just as he did. And they will not be convinced, even if one returns from the dead, to warn them. This is, a, well, it was a painting of the house, uh, supposedly where the brothers are, showing heaven above with Lazarus up there and the rich man in Hades. He's wanting someone to go to that house and tell his brothers what is happening. Brothers and sisters, we are the five brothers the rich man wants to warn. Not only did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, John chapter 11. <laughs> okay. Uh, right there. Okay. Um, see, when he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come up, come out. 
The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth, and Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Not only was Lazarus raised, but Jesus was raised as well, so that we might have forgiveness of our sin and new life in Christ. Acts 2, verses 32 to 33, tells us, This Jesus God raised up, and of, and of that all of us are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he was poured out, this that you both see and hear. The rich man serves mammon rather than God. This sentence can be taken two ways, and both are correct. The rich man worships mammon, serves mammon, rather than worshiping God or serving God. The rich man also gives mammon rather than God, gives unjust wealth instead of giving the grace of God to others. We're called to do more than simply give money to just causes. We are called to be an instrument of God in the lives of others. There really is a sidewalk. Let us use that sidewalk to cross the chasms we have built and truly serve God to others. In this way, we will draw closer to God and to others, and then we will discover our true spiritual family. Amen. Let us bow for a moment of prayer. Gracious and almighty God, help us, each one of us, to walk on the sidewalk, to see the sidewalk, to walk on the bridges that you provide so that we do not create a chasm around ourselves and put up a gate. Help us to be in relationship with all others, those that are different from us and those that are the same as us. Help us to see that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. is and 
nation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. blessing and benediction. Go forth in peace in the sure knowledge that God is walking with you with, through the Holy Spirit. He's walking beside you. He's carrying you when you cannot walk, and he is guiding you over the sidewalks and the bridges into this world to be the light of Christ in this world. Go in that sure knowledge. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed Sunday. Holy, holy.